result brought the market off of its lows. I'll add to it the retail trade, which is actually very strong in the guts of it. The, the, department store, the department stores specifically, we talked about Nordstrom, Federated, Saks, all very, very strong, uh, along with the luxury makers. You add it all up and you have, again, strength in technology and retail, weakness in financial services, although that did come back. And then the energy names picked up in the afternoon trade, which gets you to a weaker Dow, but a, a break-even mark on both the S&P and the NASDAQ. The bell rings, fourth third trading day of the uh, week is in the books, and the closing bell continues right now with Maria Bartiromo. Wall Street awash in cash. Global deal making exceeding some $300 billion in the first month of 07. But where are the deals happening now? We're looking around the world and finding the hottest areas, including South Africa. We'll zero in on the sectors ripe for consolidation. The drug companies are notorious for doling out billions of dollars for marketing to hospitals and doctors. Coming up, the growing backlash against Big Pharma and why all those freebies are being banned. And will the same issues plaguing the big three catch up to the big gun in the auto business? It's not news that Toyota has been making huge inroads into the U.S. auto mar market. Why the same problems the big three are facing could soon cut into Toyota's bottom line. All of that ahead, but first up, a mortgage meltdown leading the market lower today on Wall Street after British bank HSBC revealed it set aside nearly $1.8 billion, more than expected to cover rising bad loans to U.S. home buyers with poor credit records. That warning following last night's announcement from New Century Financial that it's restating results due to subprime loan losses. The sector was hammered today on the news. Take a look at New Century Financial down $11 now at $19.29 HSBC. Nova Star and American Home, all under some pressure. The other stocks in the sector also coming under some selling pressure with, with uh, accredited home of Fremont and Fieldstone all down. The selling also spilled over to some of the biggest financials today. And as you can see there, we had weakness across the board. Meanwhile, the broader averages were mixed overall, but in the final hour, we did see further selling in the industrial average. The Dow Jones Industrial Average today down about 29 points, finishing the session at 12,637. NASDAQ was flat on the day, back and forth between positive and negative territory. It did end, though, however, in the red column, down nearly two points. S&P 500 down one and two-thirds. In Washington tonight, CNBC's Hampton Pearson is tracking what soured the subprime sector. Hampton. Hi, Maria. In HSBC's case, it's recent bad subprime loans that have gone sour just in the last few months. But what worries mortgage analysts is a possible ripple effect in the subprime market. America's housing slowdown is costing Europe's biggest bank, HSBC, billions. Bad debt, most of it tied to subprime mortgages, is up 20%. With U.S. delinquency rates climbing and housing values and sales falling, analysts are concerned there's more bad news still out there. I think you have to be afraid of, of more landmines. Um, we really don't know just how much the lenders stretched their, their lending standards during the boom. We're starting to see the fallout now. Problems in the American market have hit several lenders for months. A recent Moody survey says industry-wide subprime foreclosures and repossessions more than doubled in the second quarter of 2006. Today, New Century Financial, a California-based REIT, says it expects 2007 loan production to drop by 20 percent as it tightens underwriting guidelines in response to a recent uptick in defaults. Evidence analysts say of a fallout on both Wall Street and Main Street. Foreclosures are up, bad loans are up. You know, this is the first big announcement, but there's going to be more. The consumer starting to fray on the edges. The ability to resell your house when you get a little tight is not there because prices are down. So foreclosures are ticking up. It's going to be a much, much tougher environment for consumer credit. So far today, little impact on the prime mortgage market, but as you just heard, consumer access to credit will be curtailed, and investors in mortgage-backed securities may be rethinking their strategy. Maria? All right, Hampton, thanks very much. Let's get right to Wall Street now with the financial fallout. Bob Pisani, our eye on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Bob? Okay, and that's the important thing here today, Maria, is we did have some concern about the subprime mortgages, but it hasn't spread to the overall markets here. Let's take a look at the markets today and see what's going on. You saw today the subprime was weak, but look a little bit beyond that. We see no sign of real consumer weakness growing. First, prime mortgages, which is the biggest part of the mortgage business, 
The lending there, intact, no sign of deterioration. Macro picture, good. Employment is strong. Look beyond that. The GDP numbers we got last week, moderate economic growth. Retail sales, we got the numbers today. By and large, they were terrific. Is business and leisure travel strong? You bet it is. Did you see the Marriott people on our air just a short while ago? They had their numbers out. Take a look at hotel stocks hitting new highs because Marriott came out and made very positive comments. Good guidance. Their pricing is strong. They've got an aggressive share repurchase program. Historic high for Marriott. Starwood at a new high, 10-year high. Hilton Hotels down a little bit, but that was an historic high yesterday. Take a look at the retailers. Good numbers overall, and many beat by a wide number. Gap beat guided higher for the quarter. Strong sales right across the board. Gap, Old Navy, Banana Republic. Federator raised guidance. guidance. Nordstrom way above numbers. Aeropostal also did very well. A little bit of murkiness in the home builders. Here is the problem here. Toll Brothers came out today and simply said they're continuing to have high loan, lo uh, high losses for their land and they're continuing to take write downs on the land. That's a problem and there's still murkiness in the housing industry. That was a big issue here today. Finally, Lear. Five hours ago, 1041 Eastern Time, halted news pending. Now remember, this is the auto parts company, Carl Icahn, made a bid on Monday, $36. Stock's near 40 because the street's anticipating someone may come in and make a counter offer or he may sweeten the offer. We've heard nothing from them so far today. We've closed, and Maria, stock never reopened and no news. Back to you. All right, Bob, thanks so much. Meanwhile, the oil market was busy today. Oil prices rallying late in the day today to close at the highest levels in 2007. Take a look. Crude futures surging by $2 a barrel, up 3%. Traders said the main reason behind today's late day move is news that Occidental Petroleum has declared force majeure at its Elk Hills, California oil field. One day after a fire there shut down 95% of its production. Later on tonight on Cudlow & Company, Larry is fueling up the gas tax debate. Is a dollar a gallon tax the best solution to reducing our dependence on foreign oil? Join Larry at 5 o'clock with the pros and cons of that debate. It was another slow day for the markets. Meanwhile, the Dow ending the trading session down about a quarter of 1%. Jeremy Nat to talk about what is putting pressure on the major indices lately. Larry Smith, the CIO, Chief Investment Officer at Third Wave Global Investors, along with John Wilson, Morgan Keegan's Chief Technical Strategist. Gentlemen, nice to have you with us. Welcome back to the closing bell. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Larry, let me ask you your uh, trends recently. Have you been allocating your money any differently in the face of the uh, gains that we've seen so far in 07? There has been a big change, Maria. I think if you take a look at what's happened to the equity market, six months ago we turned positive because if you took a look at the inflation fundamentals, the earnings fundamentals, where the Fed was likely to go, everything was really pointing to a stronger stock market. And I think we're still going to do fine over the next 12 to 18 months. But the first half of this year is going to be a choppy ride. Three things really have me concerned. Uh, the first one uh, is that stronger growth takes away this notion that the Fed's going to reverse direction. Uh, and I think they're going to stay very much vigilant here. The second thing is that despite the strong growth, what we're really seeing uh, is that earnings numbers are coming down quite dramatically. You know, we, we got used to these, these double-digit year-over-year earnings numbers, which existed for more than, than three years. But at this point in time, the first quarter numbers are being cut to 4.8%. Uh, people are going to have to adjust expectations about what to expect going forward. Um, so those two things really have me concerned. And the third thing is complacency. Right. We just went through six months of a 15% run in the S&P 500 without anything more than a 2% correction. Mm -hmm. Truly remarkable performance. What I really want to get at, though, John, is uh, Larry, rather, is exactly what you're doing with your money, how, you, how all of those reasons have actually dictated what you're doing. But, but let me bring, bring uh, John in here and, and talk to you, John, a little about what the charts are telling us. We were just looking at the major indices year to date and, and over the last year, and frankly, they look pretty good. What do you think the charts tell us about what's to come? Yeah, I think they look very good. In fact, uh, you know, if you look at the S&P 400 mid-cap, the leader this year so far of, of the major indices, transports have been up strong. And if you look at the industry groups, the 200 or so of the, the sub-industry groups, I guess, if you will, kind of break down those big pieces of pie in the S&P 500, over a third of them are up 5% so far this year. So it's a pretty broad-based rally. I like uh, what Larry has to say, and I pretty much agree with him. Uh, with one exception, I don't see that same level of complacency. I see the market sell off and all of a sudden the put call ratio jumps to 100%. I think there's still plenty of nervousness out there and I think there's uh, plenty of bricks left in that wall of worry for the market to climb. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me what you do in terms of investing, Larry. How do you dictate your dollars uh, in the face of, of what you're saying that we could see some caution uh, ahead? 
I think you have to be very careful about your net equity exposure at this point in time. There still seem to be a lot of opportunities around the world to go long some stock markets and short some others. But overall, the net equity position needs to be cut back and cut back somewhat dramatically. We're getting towards a pretty much neutral posture from a very long posture in the fourth quarter of last year. So are you pulling back in terms of retail, in terms of the areas that are so central to economic growth or not? You know, we're seeing it as, as pretty broadly based with the caveat that I think technology might be able to sail through all of this. But, you know, energy earnings are being cut quite dramatically. I think people have become too, too uh, confident there. Uh, a number of cyclicals, people are too confident. Um, we're going to need the dollar to weaken significantly from here, something that doesn't appear to be in the cards over the near term to get a lot of those deep cyclicals to, to rally. John, how about what's happening with technology? That certainly has been a standout group. Do you think that continues yeah. given the momentum? Yeah, I really, I really do, Maria. Some of the best charts I'm seeing are in the networking sector and in the storage sector. Historically, for whatever reason, when the Fed stops raising rates, the networking stocks have historically been a pretty good place to be, and that has certainly panned out once again. I also think that we could be seeing a kind of nascent opportunity developing for a decent rally in the energy sector here if we can get through some technical resistance right about where we are right now. So you want to be putting money to work then in energy? I, I would be looking for an opportunity. I'd like to see a little bit more strength, but we've taken two or three cracks uh, at the $60 level on crude. The oil service index is kind of butting up against this 50-day moving average from below. And if we can take those out, I think we'll get a, at least a rally here, if not something more. Meanwhile, uh, I'd still be overweighting tech. I'm still seeing uh, a lot of very good looking charts in the uh, technology area, as I say, in, in networking stocks right. and storage stocks, some of the software areas. Larry, let me get your, your thoughts on what happened today, which was really one of the bigger stories within the market, and that is HSBC saying that its subprime mortgage problem was worse than previously thought. Got some data here, and, and basically subprime mortgages comprise about 12 percent of the roughly $8.4 trillion. If, in fact, we do see more foreclosures and, and this situation worsen, is this going to be a big impact on the market, you think? It'll be an impact on the market, but not a huge impact on the market. I think that the general notion that we're seeing here uh, is that the consumer sector is in not as good shape as they were a year ago. And mortgage delinquencies are likely to continue to rise here. I don't think we've seen the end of that trend. All right, gentlemen, nice to have you with us. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. We'll talk with you soon. And not only was the mortgage lending sector under pressure today, shares of Toll Brothers tumble. Take a look at this. The chart shows that we saw a decline on toll. Of about 3% on the day, the luxury home builder said that orders plunged 33% in the first quarter, mostly because nervous home buyers backed out of planned purchases. Toll Brothers says demand is improving in some areas, but cancellation rates are still more than four times above the norm. The company also taking a bigger than expected land write down when it releases quarterly results later on this month because the value of that land has skidded so sharply that it's no longer financially feasible to build on it. Checking shares of some of the other home builders, as you can see there, it was a weekday across the board. The other big story this session was January same-store sales, retail. Retailers rang up solid sales last month. In fact, after the disappointing holiday period, shoppers redeemed their gift cards on items like winter clothing during the cold snap. Take a look at some of the stores that surpassed sales projections. And as you see there, Saks, Walmart, higher. The gap was down 7.7%. But Federated, uh, as you see, the gap was actually flat, which was better than the 7.7% forecast. But as you see, uh, we did have gains gains in sales across the board in the month of January. The worst than expected sales came in uh, January from Sharper Image, as well as Costco, Dillard's, Abercrombie and & Fitch, and Ann Taylor. The stocks, meanwhile, traded this way. Mixed performances there, with Saks trading up, as did The Gap and Federated. In other retail news, electronics retailer Circuit City is closing roughly 70 underperforming stores. It is shaking up its merchandising team as well. The restructuring is in response to growing pressure on Circuit City's gross margins. That's due to a fierce price war it's having with rival Best Buy on things like flat screen TVs, which, of course, is a positive for the rest of us. Investors like the news. Take a look at the stock today. It was up 5%. Still ahead, M&A mania showing no signs of slowing down. But where in the world are investors seeing the biggest boom? And then... Big Pharma offering generic drug makers pay to delay their cheaper medicine. Will Washington's remedy be a prescription for trouble on Wall Street? Is China's fast and furious run done? New concern, the bubble is about to burst. Should foreign investors be worried? Insight from an expert on investing in China.
Toyota's revving up to take pole position in the U.S. The automaker's new drive to get America's good old boys behind the wheel. It's all ahead on The Closing Bell with Maria Bartiromo. John, we need 100 copies of that report printed and shipped by tomorrow. We need a hand. Office Depot's Design, Print, and Ship Depot. Just email or bring your documents to Office Depot. We'll print and bind any size job, backed by our satisfaction guarantee. Then ship it virtually anywhere. Whoa, Office Depot, here to lend you a hand. Office Depot, taking care of business. Trading options in penny increments is now allowed at U.S. exchanges, but not readily available to traders and investors. Interactive Brokers solves this dilemma by accepting and displaying penny orders and crossing them at an exchange. With a 22% share of the U.S. options market, there are plenty of matching opportunities. Be penny wise, not nickel foolish. Interact with penny quotes on our website. Interactive Brokers. Options, stocks, futures, forex, bonds. Worldwide. Make the most of your investments and make the most of life. Tyler Matheson hosts CNBC's High Net Worth, Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on CNBC. Brought to you by Oppenheimer Funds, the right way to invest. The odds of a child being in a Broadway show are 1 in 11,000. The odds of a child being diagnosed with autism, 1 in 166. To learn the signs of autism, visit AutismSpeaks.org. Nice move. Speaking of moves, where are you putting your money these days? Uh, I'm in CGM Realty Fund. A real estate fund? You? You get the potential long-term capital appreciation of real estate, the convenience of a mutual fund, and it's managed by Ken Hebner. Good point. Maybe the last one you'll score on me. <laughs> Touche. Call 1-800-CGM-INFO for current performance information and a prospectus. Read the prospectus carefully. You are sharp today. Jared here with the champ John Cena. Everyone knows Subway restaurants for delicious low-fat subs, like the six-inch Subway Club. Order a foot long, and it's still less than half the fat of a McDonald's Big Mac. The real surprise, it's got twice the meat, so it fills me up without slowing me down. Wow. Less fat. More meat. Less fat. More meat. The delicious footlong Subway Club. Less than half the fat of a McDonald's Big Mac, but twice the meat. Subway. Eat fresh. <laughs> As Congress moves left, Larry Kudlow stays right. The right way is capitalism. Kudlow and Company, today on CNBC. America's business channel. Welcome back. A strong pipeline helped lift GlaxoSmithKline's profits by more than 5% in the last quarter. The U.K.'s biggest drug maker made about $2.3 billion between September and December. Sales were up nearly 1% to $11.7 billion as robust demand for its best-selling drugs offset adverse currency movements and rising generic competition. Meanwhile, for the first time ever, the FDA has approved over-the-counter sales of a diet pill. Glaxo's diet drug, Ally, works for blocking the absorption of about 25% of any fat the user consumes. However, the drug has uncomfortable side effects and is only intended for adults 18 and older. Let's check the stock today. It was up nearly 1%. A big drug debate is brewing on Capitol Hill, meanwhile. Recently introduced legislation from Senator Herbert Cole of Wisconsin is seeking to end a long industry practice. We're talking about brand name drug makers paying off their generic rivals to delay a cheaper drug's entry into the marketplace. Jeremy Nadd to discuss the issue is Billy Tawzin, a former House member who heads the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturing Association, the drug industry's lobbyist group. Welcome, Mr. Tawzin. Nice to have you with us. Thank you, Maria. Why don't you support the legislation? Well, because it throws a good settlement out with a bad. You know, there could be good settlements that end lawsuits about whether a patent is valid or not. And there could be bad settlements. What we've done in the law is to give the FTC the authority and the right and the obligation to check each settlement to see whether it's in the consumer's interest. What the, what the legislation would do would ban all these settlements, which would mean extended litigation, which would end up costing everybody unnecessarily. Well, everybody, certainly, uh, including the drug makers. I mean, isn't that the most important thing here as far as you're concerned? Well, the most important thing as far as we're concerned is ending litigation, getting uh, uh, some sort of settlements on, uh, completed so that 
people know exactly what their rights and responsibilities are. And if you can't settle these lawsuits, they go on interminably and you end up costing everybody money. Uh, keep in mind, these, these suits are about defending the patent time you already own. It's not about extending the patent time. It's not about whether or not a generic can enter when it should enter at the end of a patent term. It's when a generic company is supposedly infringing on a patent, which may or may not be valid. That's a suit. And to settle those suits very often benefits consumers because it does allow the generic company to come in earlier than it could otherwise. Right. Well, so so you, ought to, you, know, you ought to have somebody checking whether the settlement is good or bad. Well, 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 what about the settlement's impact on high prices? I mean, you've got Senator Herb Cole saying that the only losers here are the American people, but basically, who continue to pay unnecessarily high prices for drugs for years to come. Do you think settlements like these are, in fact, a direct result, uh, uh, cause higher prices for drugs? No, of course not. In fact, the settlement ends the litigation, which is a part of the high price, and it very often allows the generic to enter the marketplace before the end of the patent term, which means that you're going to get competition sooner. Very often, these settlements are very pro-consumer. That's why the courts uphold them. And that's why we've asked the FTC in the law to review each one. If it's a good one, prove it. If it's a bad one, deny it. That's the way it ought to be. Mm -hmm. I, I, I get you. But, you know, according to the testimony from the FTC, the FTC says that the settlements are, are restricting competition at the expense of consumers. Let me get your thoughts to this. They go on to say that their access is delayed for many years, uh, and, and that is, is, is the bottom line, and that's why consumers are really getting the short end here. What do you say to this? Well, keep in mind that the, the years we're talking about are the years that remain of a valid patent. If you invent a new drug, as you just interviewed Wyatt uh, and Bob Esner about, you'll spend 14 years of your 20 years just doing clinical trials. That leaves you very little time to market your product at the end. That is to, to get a return on the billion dollars you might spend over 14 years of clinical testing. In that, in that remaining period of time, you get challenged by a generic saying your patent is not good and we're going to take over and we're going to compete with you despite the fact that it's your invention and you spent a billion dollars. That's the lawsuits we're talking about. We're not talking about a single day longer than the law allows right now in terms of a patent. We're simply saying that when you get into one of those disputes, it very often helps the consumer to settle them and very often the generic company does come in on the settlement earlier than it would if it waited till the end of the patent term expire, expiration. So, so why, do you, why do you think then groups like the AARP are, are you know, uh, encouraging this? They're saying that they're pleased to endorse the Preserve Access to Affordable Generics Act. Well, I, I can only tell you that there's a lot of confusion about the issue. When I went to the Senate hearing, for example, there, was, there were people saying, well, the settlements extend the patent term. They do not. All they do is end the litigation about a valid patent term. The, the company cannot get a single day longer than its patent term in a settlement, any more than the law currently gives it. So there's, there's a lot of confusion about this issue. Most settlements, as you know, Maria, of any lawsuit very often involves cash payments. That's what you do when you settle a lawsuit. You settle the differences, you make a compromise, and very often it involves early entry of the generic uh, drug into the marketplace. So is that bad for consumers? Very often it's very good for consumers. The litigation, very expensive, creates uncertainty for both the drug maker and the generic company and, and hurts the marketplace by which these patented drugs that cost a heck of a lot to invent and end up you know, saving people's lives. It hurts that whole model by which the R&D, the great investments in R&D occurs. And that model is very important if we're going to continue to produce new cancer drugs and new diabetic uh, drugs, and et cetera, in the marketplace. All right. Mr. Tozen, nice to have you on the program. Thanks so much. Thank you, Maria. Billy Tozen coming to us, uh, the president and CEO of Pharma in D.C. tonight. The backlash against drug companies trying to ply doctors with free meals and gifts to buy their prescription loyalty is picking up steam. The Connecticut attorney general this week proposing a law that would make drug companies post on the web the freebies they give to doctors practicing in the state or face a $10,000 fine. CMC's pharmaceuticals reporter Mike Cuckman is here now bearing gifts.